Well, hello and greetings to everyone who's joined us uh, this afternoon or perhaps this evening or morning, depending on where you are. Great to see people from all around the world sending their greetings uh, in the chats from wherever you are. Glad you're all able to be here with us today. Uh, we're also streaming this now to our Facebook page. Hopefully some more people will be able to uh, view us on there as well. Uh, just say a few words of introduction before we get right into our uh, webinar for today. My name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy, British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London. And uh, this is the third in a series of summer webinars uh, that we're doing online. Each webinar has been focusing on a different uh, subdiscipline within linguistics. So uh, for those of you who were there, perhaps if you missed it, our first one was on documentary linguistics with BJ D'Souza reporting on his collaboration with the Russo Aka community in Northeast India. And then the second one last week was uh, on variation in language, but from a morphological syntactic perspective, uh, where um, Yanti from Atmajaya University in Indonesia and uh, Asako Shiohara from Tokyo University of Foreign, language, foreign Studies presented on their work developing a comparable corpus of varieties of Indonesian. And uh, today we're gonna to look at a different topic, more from a direct sociolinguistic perspective on speakers' attitudes. Each of these talks has also looked at communities of different sizes. So the talk on Hurusoka concerned a fairly relatively small ethnolinguistic community uh, of you know, less than 10,000 speakers. And one of the themes of that talk was that for that community, there's uh, an, uh, an ongoing fear of language shift, of language loss, and moving to other languages. And one of the themes that we discussed was that uh, that loss of that language or that community uh, would mean, in a sense, a loss of the identity as well because of the way that language and um, identity are, are tied in together. Yanti and Zako's work on Indonesian was focused on larger population, urban groups where people from several different language groups are in an urban context talking to each other in a regional language. And they are able to document some new emerging varieties that are coming about in this context and the ways that uh, regional languages are, are being influenced and differentiated. And some of the speakers that participated in their study were quite self-aware of the varieties that they were using, the way that, that distinguished them from other groups, the way that defined them as a local, they're quite aware that if they chose a more prestigious variety, they might be viewed as an outsider by their own community. And so there's definitely this sense of identity as being a part of this urban context versus other contexts within the same country. And today's talk expands even larger to the national level. So now looking at a language and identity, a like sense of a, a national identity of nation state, looking at the uh, use of English or English speakers in Nigeria and asking questions about how they see their use of language. Is it a marker of national identity for them? Do the way people speak English in Nigeria, uh, is it viewed as something that distinguishes them from speakers of English in other countries, whether that be uh, in England or in US or Canada or Jamaica or Singapore or wherever? Our speaker today is Kingsley Uguayani. Uh, Kingsley holds a post teaching English linguistics at the University of Nigeria, Nsuka, but he's currently on leave. Uh, working on his PhD at the University of Northumbria in the UK. Uh, tomorrow is actually Kingsley's Viva, which is the UK term for the oral defense of his thesis. So this is uh, quite an important week for him, a culmination of years of study. So we're thankful that you're taking the time out to do this with us as well. And we hope that uh, this hour together uh, is not a taxing burden, but hopefully it's an encouraging and engaging, maybe a bit of a practice uh, Hopefully there will be some perceptive and insightful questions that will uh, prepare you for tomorrow's more, I'm sure, rigorous questioning of the ideas you've been working on for the last few years. Uh, I first came across Kingsley's work online because I was reading about a project by the Oxford English Dictionary last year about incorporating Nigerian English words into the Oxford English Dictionary. And Kingsley was a consultant on that project. I think he'll mention it today as well. So that was a really interesting work. And if you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to, to look that up. But uh, yeah, that's where my uh, first came across Kingsley's work in that project. Before I hand it over to Kingsley to speak for about 40 minutes, uh, I just mentioned that we'll take questions at the end. And I think we'll do this again via the chat function. So if at any time you think of a question that you'd like to uh, get some more uh, feedback on, feel free to type that into the chat. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can make a comment there and I'll try to get there to uh, 
to uh, read those comments as well. And whatever time we have left in our hour together, we'll try to get to those comments. Uh, I think that's all I need to say as an introduction. So let me uh, hand it over to uh, Kinsley. Let me make sure I can unmute you. Okay. And yeah, so thank you for being with us today and we look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you so much, um, Joey. And uh, it's my pleasure to be talking about this today. And um, as um, Joey has mentioned, perhaps uh, this is going to be like a mock viva as um, I'll be vibrating tomorrow, so to speak. Right, so um, I'll try to share my screen immediately. Can you all see my screen now? Yeah, I can, we can see the, I can see the PowerPoint, oh, it's gone now. Right, yeah, can you okay. see my screen now, everyone? Yeah, so I can see the whole PowerPoint uh, program, yeah. There we go, I can see yeah. the whole screen now. Right, yes, let me uh, begin by thanking you, Joey, for the opportunity to do this and then to the linguistics um, webinar series um, team and so on. And to also thank every one of you who have um, joined this from um, all across the world. And, and um, as you already know, today I'll be talking about Nigerian English and national identity. And um, because I have just 40 minutes and so I'll, this is the outline of what I'll be talking about today. And just uh, so some kind of background. What I'm going to present today is just a small aspect of my doctoral research, um, which um, I've been condu uh, conducting for, for some years now. And I'm looking at uh, Nigerian English from language ownership um, uh, framework, so to speak, looking at to what extent do Nigerians um, um, construct themselves as owners of English, so to speak, considering that English has uh, taken root in Nigeria. And I mean, it is not, uh, it's not anything new. So I would just start by giving some form of background and talk about the national language debate in Nigeria, and then look at two um, opposing forces, so to speak, of looking at English. English as a national language or English as an international language. Right, and I look at um, the, the issue I will be addressing, and then just um, a short one on methods, and then I'll dwell on my findings, and I'll summarize with um, one or two points of discussion or conclusion. Right um, now, beginning with the background, uh, Nigeria is an extremely complex multilingual has an extremely complex multilingual configuration with about two hundred and 524 languages, even though I think about um, seven or nine of these are not living. So, so to speak, you will see that um, it's, it's, it's only third to Guinea, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia that have about 800 and 700 languages respectively. In Nigeria, it could be said to be the um, the third country in the world with the highest number of languages, and that's from ethnologue. And English has been a core official language, right, of the country since around uh, 1900, when, when colonialism is said to have begun officially. But today, however, English seems to be the de facto um, official language. And I am careful with the use of the word. I'm intentional with the use of the definite um, the, right? Right. So that in terms of, even though, I mean, for officially speaking, it's, it's only a co official language, co with the other um, three indigenous languages as it were. But in reality, actually, it is the only one. And the position of English, the position of English now occupies in both the private and public lives of Nigerians. I suggest that there's an increased use of English as, as the, in today's Nigeria. And however, generally, even though English is generally regarded as an L2 in Nigeria, evidence shows, as we will see here and from other research sources, that there is now a fast growing number, fast increasing number of L1 speakers of English in Nigeria. 
and there's been debate upon debate on whether what to what is the 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 the, the term to capture these ones. Um, L1 speakers of Nigerian English and somebody at I think it was Berogi who said um, they are um, first language speakers of English as a second language. Very something very ironical to say, right? But that is just an indication of the debate around how to capture this great number of um, L1 speakers of Nigerian English, which is how I prefer to put it, right? So this this gives you. Um, an idea of the number of languages and their official their status, so to speak. You will see that um, there's English there, there's, uh, there's French there, surprisingly, to be very surprising to many people to see that French there is the co-official language. It's a debate I don't want, I would not want to dwell on so much, right? Yes, but um, it's sometime in 1996, when the country was still under a military uh, regime. The military head of state then, um, General uh, Sani Abacha, because there was that there was some diplomatic war going on between between um, Nigeria and uh, the English-speaking Western world. So, just in a way to spite the English-speaking Western world, the military head of state made a fluke pronouncement that French will now be one of the official languages, but. It, 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 it just ended there. So it's very controversial to even mention it. Some, some linguists say it shouldn't even be mentioned at all because it didn't go beyond that one day, one day pronouncement. And, right, but so um, you see that there is English, Nigeria, French, of course, is there. But also I have to acknowledge that because Nigeria shares border with um, French speaking com um, countries, that the border communities um, speak French as well. Some of them are speak to the two, the two languages or even more, right? But that's not uh, what I want to dwell on today. Now look, there's Nigerian Pidgin, there's Arabic, which is more or less um, a religious language. And then the, the what um, in literature is called the majors, the three majors, that's Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, right? They are called the majors for basically two reasons, right? One is the number of speakers. They have um, the highest number of speakers um, in, in comparison with the others. That the, each one of them has at least 18 million speakers, according to uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis et al. Right. So, but then also they are called majors because they are the three co official languages, officially speaking, the three co official languages um, that shares the, that official space with English, so to speak. Right. But you also see that they are designated as the national languages. So while the three of them, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, um, uh, um, are called, they are, they are co-official, but as well, they, set, they are designated the national languages, which English is not designated. And that is what we'll be looking at today. And then um, the other minorities and the, what is called the major minors and, and the, the rest of them. So, um, I move on to looking at the, the national language debate in Nigeria, which has been very hot, right? But I, would, I must acknowledge that it is no longer as hot as it used to be, maybe in the early um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It is dying down. The debate is dying down a bit now. And maybe um, the findings I'm going to present today and um, also maybe um, but that research evidence indicates that uh, Nigerians may, may be on their way to um, settling for one of the languages. So the status quo says that, so there are at least four schools of thought regarding which language or languages should be regarded as the national language in Nigeria. The status quo, the official designation as of today is that the national languages are Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. All right. But then what I have in the in parentheses there is the major criticism against the status quo, that there's some element of linguistic imperialism, because this is a country that has over 500 languages, right? And only three are designated national. What happens to the other speakers of over, over still over 500? There's bound to be complaints about linguistic imperialism, right? So the second um, school, so to speak, is the use of English, or Nigerian English more specifically. Right, but one criticism against this is that um, some people who 
think that this shouldn't be because they do not feel that Nigerian English is, is truly English, right? I remember uh, one of my participants, um, I just remember it now, it's not what I have in, this, in, in, in my slide today. One of my participants um, mentioned to me, see, I, I, I know we have Nigerian English. I believe we, I, I use Nigerian English, but because the word English is still attached to it, I do not think, uh, I'm not comfortable with it. That was how he, I'm not putting him verbatim. I'm not comfortable with the word that English is still there. It means, it reminds me that this is coming from somewhere, right? So there is, there is still that lingering that even if it is Nigerianized, even if English is Nigerianized, it is not, is it really truly Nigerian? All right. So this, the third school is, uh, have proposed that Nigerian pidgin, the pidgin variety spoken in Nigeria with um, very close variety spoken um, across the other um, neighboring West African countries like Ghana, like Cameroon, all right? But one argument also is that this is also too close to English, especially in terms of vocabulary. In terms of its vocabulary is also too close to English. So that's one debate. And then another debate, um, another criticism against it is that it may not really um, be, um, uh, be written in terms of written form, even though I mean, evidence research evidence shows that this is not um, this is not a valid argument. But that's one of the things that people say, right? Again, there have been other debates about using other indigenous languages apart from the first three. The argument being that if you choose a minor a minority language, so to speak, and I do not use that word minority um, with the sense of a value judgment, so to speak. I do not. Right, but minority in terms of number of speakers. And so people are still using other minority languages because their speakers are so small and they are not as powerful as the other. They will not, their, those languages will not seem to be domineering other ones, all right? And a lot of proposals have been made, Igala and all that have been proposed. But then one key argument about this is that if you use a language just spoken by maybe um, um, a few hundred um, speakers, the language may not be widespread, may not be developed, and this, so there's an ongoing debate about which one it should be. And, right, so, um, so English, it seems, is English now the preferred language, language so to speak? So, um, Afoloyan has for a long time said that it is unrealistic for anybody in Nigeria today to think that national unity can be forged in this country without recourse to the utilization of the English language. The fact, the fact that it is now functioning as the language of Nigerian nationism cannot be denied, right? So the, much of this debate, however, um, has remained as public opinion, public opinion, even though there has been some academic engagement with it. So there are no studies available at the moment indicating the degree to which Nigerians in the 21st century may continue to associate English with, the, with British imperialism, especially as a variety of English distinctively Nigerian has emerged. Um, in other words, it has yet to be empirically investigated what attitudes Nigerians would have towards English in terms of accepting it as a language of their cultural national identity. So in, in my study, um, I wanted to investigate, I mean, this aspect of the study, as I've mentioned, this is a part of a broader, a bigger, a larger study I, I'm doing on Nigerian English. Right, so I wanted to investigate the extent to which Nigerians will regard Nigerian English as expressive of a true Nigerian identity. And as um, some scholars like Unebu mentioned, um, is that English has become a necessary evil, so to speak. So even though uh, one argument, uh, as I've mentioned, is that as an ex-colonial language, English carries with it a symbolic value that is directly opposed to nationalist ideal, so to speak. So as I've just mentioned, uh, one of my participants uh, pointed out. So this creates some kind of tension between two schools. Those who think that no matter what English cannot carry the cultural identity of Nigerians, and those who believe that it can, since English can be nativized. Right, so um, moving on. So why does the national language question seem so hotly debated? 
in Nigeria, and I, I mean, also maybe also elsewhere. One reason I found is that there is a lot of ethnic politics in Nigeria, and Nigeria, apart from the numerous languages, there are also over 250 ethnic groups, at, um, and this is a country that is. Uh, divided along the lines of ethno-linguistic and um, religious identities. So these things matter a lot. So seeing, for instance, that seeing, for instance, that um, Nigeria as it is, is it can be argued a little polarized ethno-linguistically. Does this still make sense in any way to talk about Nigerian identity, even when some people would um, think of themselves primarily as Igbo or Hausa or Yoruba. So whether there is some kind of affiliation towards Nigeria, right? So when I talk about nation here, I, I do not I intend to use it in a very strict um, sense, in a very traditional sense, in which nation refers to a group of people with um, shared um, ancestry, shared history, and even shared um, language. No. I use it in the sense of a nation state, nation state of identity, of course. Having brought these groups of people, uh, these ethnic groups together under one, um, one national identity called Nigeria. Is it, is, it, is it possible to talk about national identity in that regard? So that when I mention, when I talk about national identity, I use it in that um, more liberal sense of nation state rather than the traditional way of understanding nation, which um, would would see many nations, maybe over 200 nations in Nigeria. Right, so, so nations may be viewed as imagined or arbitrary, um, but through texts, through myths, through narratives and attitudes, a sense of national um, identity is sustained. And this idea of imagined or arbitrary is even more more uh, important in a multilingual, multicultural um, uh, society like Nigeria, where there may be that kind of tendency for people to affiliate towards the more local, more regional, more ethnic identities rather than the national identities. However, the uh, national language is the ultimate, as Joseph argues, is the ultimate unifying narrative because it helps to rescue national identity from its arbitrariness. And that's why um, countries spend a lot to maintain, in, in a sense, what is called national language. So this gives us a background about what national language debate, um, why it's important, and particularly why it's important in the Nigerian context. So I move on to talk about the two broad ways um, in which English is perceived. One, one is English as an international language. The other is English as a national language. And one term which, which um, um, some world English researchers have used to capture these two broad um, perspectives is um, global, glo global English, right? And I, I, I borrow Perogi, uh, with, uh, I borrow that term from Perogi and others, other scholars like Rob D as well. So English is both local and global, right? Because, because English, well, I'll say arguably, is the language of globalization, right? And people, when they want to communicate at the global stage, uh, the, the default language, generally speaking, is, is likely going to be English. And there has been debate for and against um, this situation. So when English is perceived as an international language, it is perceived in the sense of that, that monolithic sense of one standard, international standard English, right? But then when English is perceived as a national language, it, is, it, is, it, it comes with that pluricentric, um, sense of having diverse norms, diverse standards, and where um, the centers seem to be disintegrating, so to speak. All right, and then we begin to talk about English in plural time. And Crystal in, um, mentions, um, gives an example of how nations um, perceive these two broad uh, perspectives of looking at the, the development of English. So, uh, 
Crystal says a nation, when it is when English is considered an international language, looks out from itself. That is, that's that kind of outward looking at the world as a whole and tries to define its linguistic needs in relation to that world. But on the other hand, when English is perceived as a national language, the nation looks within itself at the structure of its society and the psychology of its people, which um, for me pertains to attitudes of, 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 of people, which is what I'll be looking at today, and tries to define its linguistic needs in relation to its sense of national identity. So, I, like, I saw this quote from Joseph Sanders, which I love so much, the grammatical being called a nation. So that because nation could be imagined or arbitrary, and I've mentioned in the two previous, um, the, um, in, the previous in the previous slide, that the, it is language, or I'll say language is one of the key things that is used in terms of narrative, in terms of attitude, that is used to sustain that sense of national identity. So it is in that sense that um, you may begin to look at the nation as a grammatical being, as a grammatical entity, so to speak. So the, I take, I go back to that crystal statement because that captures what I'm looking at now because I'm narrowing down to local national identity. That's English as a national language rather than English as an international language. It's not out of place really because you see that speakers of English think globally. So while, while that, while that local identity is emphasized, there, there may still be that sense of um, uh, global, using English at the global level. So uh, moving on, I look at Nigerian English and the question of national identity in Nigeria. So the aspect, the aspect of my study uh, presented here considers the extent to which speakers, speakers sense of Nigerian identity might mediate their sense of collective ownership of English, which is, a, which is the fulcrum of my, uh, my, my overall debate in my thesis. So since it has been suggested that speakers' sense of national identity tends to interact with their overall attitude towards the languages in their, in their country, it was thought to evaluate how a sense of national identity might relate to the sense of ownership of English and subsequent consideration as a national language. Right. So um, just to be sure that everybody is still, uh, Joey, am I still being heard? Yes. Loud All right. Just, I just needed to confirm so that uh, to be sure I'm not speaking just to myself. Sorry, sorry it's a bit awkward. awkward. This sorry? Sorry, it's a difficult format where you can't see any of us, but we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, yeah, I can only see myself and uh, other people's images. That, so that's fine. Just to confirm that um, I can still be heard. Right. This is just a quick summary of the methods I used in, and I summarized the overall, the overall um, methods I used for my for my uh, the larger study. Uh, participants who are um, usually university students, and then I used um, survey, I used accessibility judgment tax, which is what I find as the most interesting uh, part of my study. And it was yesterday I was just preparing this slide. I said, well, maybe I would have presented something from my accessibility judgment tax, which was a very interesting study, really. But for this um, study, I'll be presenting some aspect uh, because, well, uh, my acceptability judgment tax. Um, relates more to the acceptability of specific features of Nigerian English, which I wouldn't um, want to mention today because I want to go to the um, survey and the interview as they relate more to what I am talking about today. All right. So um, this is the first table which uh, summarizes um, a set of um, items uh, posed to, the, um, to my participants. And looking at this uh, general, st um, general uh, descriptive statistics, you will see that, um, uh, well, just uh, some kind of background to help um, the audience. The, the, it was a scale of one to seven in terms of agreement, where one um, certainly was the lowest and seven was the um, highest. So we see uh, most of them here, at least above the 
the mid the midpoint, so to speak, and some of them quite very close to quite very close to um, the highest point, so to speak. So looking at some of them, for instance, if you take a look at the number two, uh, Nigerian English expresses Nigerian things or thoughts um, better than any other kind of English. The finding here uh, seems to correspond with the view of um, world English scholars that the emergence of endonormative varieties of English tends to be contingent on speakers' desire to have a variety which embodies the local um, social linguistic identity. Right, and if I will um, just call up um, Schneider's uh, dynamic model here, which says that post-colonial writers of English emerge um, as a result of a dynamic uh, relationship between the, the, the settlers and the indigenous um, communities, right? Even though uh, in, in Nigeria, so to speak, um, there is no settler community in a very strict sense, as Joe uh, 2019 argues, right? But it is still possible to think about that in this direction. What Schneider argues in that model is that it is identity construction. Identity construction is one of the parameters that drives, that drives the emergence of new English. So that speakers of the speakers of English in post-colonial societies begin at some point, even, even while the colonizers um, or the settler gr um, group are still with them or still live with them, begin to realize that there is something about us, linguistically speaking, that is different from how um, the other, I use that other in terms of identity, the other group, that is the colonial group, uh, the colon colonialist group, use English. And it is this sense of identity construction and um, that drives the development of um, uh, local varieties of English in post-colonial societies. So if you look at number three, for instance, you consider, you can, you're considering the uh, affiliation in, in time, in, in light of this unique role, it becomes even clearer why there is a considerable high identification with Nigerian English. Because you see that since there is no one language spoken by all Nigerians, Nigerian English can be said to better unite us as Nigerians. And we see more of this when I, once I move to the interview uh, results. And then look, taking the last one, um, um, scholars of world Englishes uh, have argued that a high acceptance of an endowment as a local variety is, as a legitimate variety, allows the speakers to grant agency and legitimacy to themselves as well as to the varieties of English they speak, an attitude which has been found to be um, an indicator of English language ownership. So, <clears throat> so look, um, taking also an, an another set of questions, um, we see, for instance, here that given this outcome in the first one, first item here, it can be argued that there exists correlation between participants' perception of English or ownership of it. And their, and, their, and their sense of who they are as Nigerians. Because many of them will say that when, when I speak English, I would want to retain my identity as a Nigerian. Right, so I want to speak English the Nigerian way, so to speak. So uh, one possible interpretation of, uh, for number two, um, the ambivalent attitude, is that why participants wish to retain their Nigerianness, why speak English, as you can see in number one, um, they might be concerned about their English drifting away to the extent that other English speakers around the world might begin to find it difficult to understand them. And that connects to what I've um, said again, that speakers of English in the non-native non -native, um, context or non-inner circle, um, that's what I prefer to use, using Catrus term, the non-inner circle um, context. Um, they tend to project themselves as global users of English, in which they simultaneously aim to project themselves as global while retaining their local linguistic um, identities. So uh, number three, for instance, is the majority of the participants are bilingual or multilinguals. It was thought that they might exhibit unfavorable attitude towards Nigerians who are monolinguals of English in relation to their Nigerian identity. But contrary to this assumption, the main score indicated that overall, they seem to favorably perceive this class of speakers of English in Nigeria even though the mean score does not indicate a clear majority, suggests that the participants tended to view 
monolingual users of English as no less Nigerians. In fact, one of the interviewers stated that to be truly Nigerian, one should be able to speak English, since it is the only language which unites Nigerians' ethnolinguistic groups. But the last item here is that we investigated whether participants consider the effect of their speaking to other Nigerians in English on their uh, Nigerian identity. And of course, we can see this indicates that more than half of them did not consider that speaking English makes anyone less Nigerian. Right. So moving forward, I performed maneuver on the, uh, the moderately correlated groups of variables, as um, I was seeing in tables in table one items, and we just saw in previous uh, slide. And to find out if there were some kind of difference uh, according to groups of, according to participants L1 and identification, especially as there may be that uh, affiliation, as I mentioned earlier, towards more uh, regional or more ethno-linguistic uh, identity, right? But um, incidentally, there was no, um, there was no uh, difference found, as you can see by the, the pillar stress test, the statistic test, that, that there was no difference found Participants did not differ on ethnic and um, um, L1 affiliations. But I must mention here, even though I've not presented here, that um, I conceptualize this as macro ownership of English in the larger study. But in the, in the micro ownership, um, in the micro affiliation towards English, which, which, which I conceptualize as attitudes towards the individual, the languages they speak in terms of preference, language preferences. Uh, some groups, particularly the L1 speakers of the house, have tended to um, demonstrate a weaker sense of ownership in that, in that dimension. But that's not what I, I'm presenting here. I'm looking at the collective macro ownership, so to speak. So um, also, as you can see here, this, there was also no difference among these groups. So what does this mean? It suggests that when it comes to linguistically defining what it means to be Nigerian, L1s and ethnicity, do not seem to, um, to matter as such. Right, then it, we'll see very shortly that it was actually at the interview stage that the reasons behind a participant's orientation towards Nigerian English as a, a harbinger of Nigerian identity began to emerge. And, and as one, one interview, he clearly put it, he says, Nigeria, Nigerian English, it gives you a sense of identity uh, in Nigeria. And you will see the use of double subjects there, which is a, a key feature of, um, a key semantic feature, oh, sorry, a morphosyntactic feature, or clearly syntactic feature of Nigerian English, the use of double subjects. Nigerian English, it gives you, instead of Nigerian English gives you, or Nigerian English, or it gives you, right. So which is, I mean, even uh, the key feature of the standard variety of Nigerian English. Right. So. Ethnic polarization might be one of the reasons many people seem not to accept the current designation of only, uh, of only three languages as national languages. Those who do not speak any of these three languages tend to express resentment towards the language policy. And then also even those, even uh, people who speak one of these languages might still resent the use of the other languages in national discourse. As one interview puts it, our president, uh, our president, because he's Hausa Fulani, cannot just come and give presidential talks in Hausa language or maybe their uh, Fulani language. So um, English is like the bedrock of, for everything in Nigeria. So without English, just like um, Tower of Babel, and, um, you know. So the other interviewer says, you have to learn and speak English. Or let me say English is like the connecting language, I guess. The, um, um, language that we use in place of a national language. So in place of a national language, we make use of English and it's serving the purpose it's working, serving the purpose it's working well, I guess. In fact, English is our national language. Right. And this draws me to an example of what happened in Nigeria in 2017. During the one of the Islamic um, holidays, Islamic celebrations, the president um, was not in the country. The president was uh, receiving medical treatment, medical attention outside the country. I think that was UK at the time. So um, during that um, event, which is a national holiday and it's a Nigerian thing, even though um, not, we have two key relig religious, religious groups 
Christians and Muslims in Nigeria. The president himself is Muslim and is from his house. So the president sends an audio message to Nigerians in Hausa, and that received a lot of backlash from Nigerians, a lot of backlash from Nigerians. And I just tried to um, get a few of them, right? A few of um, what people were saying about it in, uh, from Twitter, right? Even from other social media um, platforms, but I'm more conversant with Twitter, so that's what, that's what I got evidence from. So let's accept that Buhari uh, sent a voice message. Sounds ridiculous. Yeah. So he did it in Hausa. Buhari is a threat to national unity. All right. And we can see all these people um, complaining. Right. And if you look at um, the, the second one by your left, with, by Hammer. So imagine how I would have felt if a passenger addressed the nation in Yoruba or Jack, that's good luck, uh, Bele Jonathan, in a job. Whoever told Buhari to speak Hausa is shallow, right? This, this person speaks Hausa and maybe should have been comfortable, shouldn't have been complaining, right? But he's reflecting what would have happened if previous presidents, mentioning um, um, two previous presidents, if they had spoken to the if they had spoken to the nation in their own uh, regional languages, what how he would have felt, and he felt he would have felt so, so bad. And uh, they, they are shocked there, says, of course. Uh, says uh, President of the North. How nice, President of the North. And remember that Hausa is one of the national languages, right? So it, began, it begins to make sense to me that if the use of any of the national languages in national discourses, like the, the President did in 2017, portends crisis, why the use of English brings national unification, it seems safe to claim that English is considered more national, more Nigerian, so to speak, than other languages, suggesting that English is indeed the language which conveys participants' sense of national, that Nigerian national identity. Such a connection between English, Nigerian English, if you prefer, and a sense of national identity, it can be argued, demonstrates some sense of uh, micro ownership of English. So, um, Looking at the other interview findings, another reason um, which people gave is that it is not just English. There is that the unique ways in which Nigerians speak English connects also to this sense of um, being Nigerian. And uh, commenting on whether Nigerian English uh, can be accepted as the language which represents one's identity as a Nigerian, one interview he said, yes, it can. It can if we are ready to embrace it. That's the thing. To me, there is no problem with Nigerian English. I school myself to make sure that if I am talking anywhere, I am talking the same way because there was a time I would say everybody is welcome, everybody is ready to blah, blah, speaking, try to speak in an atypical Nigerian accent. After a while, I said, I said, no, I am not happy. It's not, it's not, it doesn't sound like me. I want to be myself. So though this speaker was specifically referring to her accent, and to her Nigerian English accent. Her assertion seems to show how much she thinks Nigerian English is demonstrative of her identity as a Nigerian. This view was echoed by other informants who remarked that Nigerians who speak Nigerian English with a non-Nigerian accent are simply being pretentious. And you can see the second interviewer says that, I had this friend who traveled outside Nigeria for summer holidays. She just spent two months, and when she came back, we are hearing, oh my gosh, hi guys, oh my, I can't sit here. And I couldn't uh, get this voice to play for us, but the, the, the interviewee was changing her accent to reflect this atypical Nigerian accent. So everybody was like, why, why is this one forming? And forming is an interesting Nigerian English word, which means to pretend, to pretend. And as we can see in uh, the, these tweets um, from Nigerians, there's also an example of someone uh, using the word form. And the, I'll give you a background to these tweets. In 2007 edition of BBN Niger, which is Big Brother Niger, and instantly the program is on, on now for the 2020 edition. It's a very popular reality competition, uh, competition TV series in Nigeria. One of the housemates, yes, the participants in that um, reality a TV show or competition are called housemates. 
one of the housemates called, this was his 2017 edition, called Gifty, received a lot of crit, um, criticism from Nigerians for her, what most Nigerians called her fake accent. That was the, the hashtag fake accent was trended at the, at the time because her, they perceived that her, her, her accent was on Nigerian. In fact, in a later interview, Gifty herself acknowledged that her accent may have contributed to why she was evicted because she was evicted quite early there. And you can see these are what people were saying. Um, um, gifting and her fake accent and nonsense English should go home on Sunday, right? That should be evicted on Sunday, right? So um, nonsense English here seems to me to suggest any English um, that is said in an a typical Nigerian way or Nigerian accent um, is, 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 not, is not us. So the participants um, or the viewers to this program or Nigerians who are following this program on, on social media were saying, this one is not really us. It doesn't, it's not really sounding like us, so to speak. So Gifty should try and ditch the locally acquired foreign accent. And if you look at locally acquired foreign accent, the abbreviation there is LAFA. LAFA became very popular. That's locally acquired foreign accent. It was, that, is, that became one, um, one where people used to associate this kind of accent with. That this is not us. It's not working at all. And a very popular uh, movie star, um, Funka Kindele, who is um, popularly known as Jennifer, referred, said, ac actress indeed, with her funny accent. Let her get a brighter grammar and learn how to pronounce words properly without adding r or r to every word. And this calls to mind immediately that in terms of roticity, Nigerian English is, uh, so Gifty was trying to speak with American English, which, uh, which is rhotic. And uh, as we know, American English is rhotic. But Nigerian English is not rhotic. So many Nigerians say that this, um, this is not really us. And that, that was, that's the evidence that was um, emerging. Right. So, and um, also in um, two events also, um, which for that lens credence to the overall positive attitudes that Nigerians have towards Nigerian English. One of the events is that in 2019, Google launched, um, launched a Nigerian English accent. So in terms of voice selection, you can have Australian, Indian, Nigerian English, and that and that. And that also received um, a lot of attention on social media and even the traditional media. And it was, the attention was that of acceptance, so to speak. And Google, um, um, as one, as Bolan Le mentioned, Google Maps Lady, that's the voice reading it is a female voice. That's, that's what you call Google Maps Lady now has a Nigerian accent. And there are many, many uh, tweets around this. I couldn't mind all of them. And also, um, uh, because I, I'm going to go off this slide to show you the video, what people are, what we are talking about, what people were saying about these two events. So I want to talk about the two of them before I show you the video. Another event was in early, early 2020, early this year, particularly January, February, right? OED, some Nigerian English words uh, made it to the OED. Oxford Dictionary added um, some Nigerian English words. And as Joey said in, during the introduction, I was part of this project as the, the uh, OED's consultant on, on the project. And I learned a lot. And then when this um, thing was launched, that is in January, when these about 29 Nigerian English words were added. Now, a lot of uh, Nigerians were talking, a lot of things were said. And for instance, UK and Nigeria say, great news. As for the English dictionary, OED has added new words from Nigerian English to its dictionary. Nigerians have made a distinctive contribution to English as a global language. Mado, Mado is a Nigerian English expression, which people just use as an um, expression, though it's not one of the words that made it. And, but a very interesting, striking point uh, made there is all those English teachers saying there is nothing like next tomorrow. Next tomorrow means the day after tomorrow. That's one of the words added there. How on a day with that pigeon, really? That is. What do you now say? You, you, are, you have not been searched or something that OED adding this has not made you uh, to shut um, up, so to speak. So I'm going to show uh, uh, quickly share 
video about what Nigerians were saying about these two projects. And um, uh, Joey, can everybody see my video? Yeah, I can see the video. And let me mention we have about 10 minutes uh, left if we're getting to your Right, side. yes, I'm aware. Um, Continue on Alfred Iwani Road for one and a half kilometers. The Nigeria accents on that Google map is much more better than the white accents. When I heard it, I was very happy and the voice is clear. For the white accents, if you are not that limit, you won't be able to hear what the lady is saying. The other one, the Igbo boys, that one we call aggression allows us to you hear it clearly. But now the Nigeria boys are what? So wonderful. There's nine minute congestion on Alfred Biwani Road in 50 meters. You are still on the fastest route. Right, that's on the Google uh, Map project. Then on the Nigerian English project, this uh, was what people were saying. Nigerian English has made its first appearance in the Oxford English Dictionary with the inclusion of 29 words and phrases. Chop, quick, quick. To chop, meaning to illicitly make money, Tukumbo. and to kumbo, denoting an imported second hand product are among the additions coming after the country's culture exploded globally in recent years. Author T.J. Benson, whose favorite of the new Nigerian terms is severally meaning repeatedly, said getting such recognition has not been easy, but that it is important. Many people might um, take for granted, but it forms a large part of our identities. And when it is being um, suppressed or we have been told that there is a better way or, or this is what is correct and then this is what's um, not correct. I think it affects us and it also demeans us. A number of the additions hail literally from Nigeria streets, such as Buka and Mamapu to a roadside street stall. Right. Um, I would uh, stop it there and then I'll just have uh, one more um, slide to show and that will be all. Right, so the next question I would um, ask, yeah, I hope everybody can see my screen now. Yes, I can see it. Is what does this all mean? And I'll conclude with these two um, um, statements from Chimamanda Adichie and OED in the 2020 edition. So Chimamanda was saying, my, my English speaking is rooted in a Nigerian experience and not in the British or American or Australian one, even though she lives most of her life in, uh, she's left, lived most of her life in the US. I have taken ownership of English. All right, so I'll summarize and I'll end with this. So since the findings of the present study suggest that there are growing positive attitudes towards English, time might be ripe to redefine the role of English, specifically Nigerian English in Nigerians' national life. For instance, even though official policy documents such as the Constitution and National Policy on Education designate English as an official language, they do so within a monolithic and an exonomative conceptualization of English, English, and then maybe British English. So it is surprising that in today's Nigeria, with all the evidence presented here and in other studies, much of English language pedagogy remains exonomative, including public examinations such as WAEC, and um, NECO and JAM that have continued to test students based on, on, on RP. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, it might be time to officially declare Nigerian English as Nigerians and uh, our national language. Evidence from this study indicates that some participants already consider Nigeria, in Nigerian English uh, Nigerians national language, since none of the other indigenous languages can perform such a role without goring some oxen. And, um, these are my references. I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much for listening, and I will take a few questions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Kingsley. A very uh, informative and also engaging uh, presentation. Lots to, lots to learn and lots of interesting things. Uh, so those of you who are, are watching here on Zoom, please uh, write in any questions you have in the chat. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, let me ask one brief question before I get to other questions. Uh, 
specifically about your methodology and the participants you had. So you mentioned there were uh, university students. Yeah. And I wonder if you would expect there to be variation in language attitudes and identity questions if you went to say non-university students, those in non-urban environments, those are agriculturalists, pastoralists, those in other parts of the country, different regions, would you expect there to be some variation? Most likely, yes. Uh, and uh, in my larger study, I specified that um, the, my study didn't cover, um, that's um, age is one of, I didn't miss it because I found that most of the, the people who considered my, my study are young people. And one reason why I chose young people is that um, previous research have um, indicated that, have, I mean, found that um, younger speakers tend to have more positive attitudes towards English. All right, so that if, for instance, um, another study is conducted among maybe older generation or non-student population, like uh, working population or, or a, a different kind of um, yeah, thing might emerge, certainly. And I recognize that, um, that but at the university, um, I, it might, I was intentional with my choice of university, but I chose federal universities, which, um, operate what in Nigeria is called federal character, in which um, people from across the world, across the, the country, um, come to study. And um, there is that, it is not, federal universities are not the cost yet. So even the people who are not from very, very high socioeconomic background and are able to attend. So I consider that, that uh, diversity and, uh, in my data. But then I acknowledge that um, if, other participants, like the older speakers, um, a, a different kind of uh, image uh, might uh, emerge. Yeah. Uh, it's a question from one of our uh, participants here. Uh, ask, um, has English brought any effect on other indigenous languages in Nigeria? And what, what's been the effect? So as English grows in influence, has there been an effect on the indigenous languages? Yes, is um, is the straight answer, and we we're talking about Englishization and in English being imperialistic. Yes, that's the truth. And I'll just I'll just use one of my ex my experience when I was translating for Oxford Dictionaries in two thousand and seventeen. Right, I was translating for the um, API project on Oxford uh, English Igbo, Igbo is one, one of the national languages. So the editor um, who was coordinating what I was doing said, when I, came, when I wanted to translate the word car in Igbo, right? I used the word moto and ubala. Ubala is the traditional Igbo word for that, right? But moto, most people speak moto. So I told the editor, right? If I ask my mother or my grandmother who doesn't speak English, um, what do you call car? She's going to say moto. And that is effect of English. And even though most Igbo people know that if, the, the traditional Igbo word for that is Ubala, but how many people in today's contemporary Igbo, not many people would, 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 stay, would say that. And because English has been in Nigeria for a long time, there's been a lot of influence um, from English with a lot of uh, other indigenous Nigerian language borrowing. It's an interaction, it's a language contact situation. While English borrows from indigenous languages, indigenous languages also borrow from English. So yes, there is, yeah. Uh, another question um, on this idea of making English a natural language. Uh, what would be the implications of making English a national language in Nigeria for those Nigerians who don't speak English? Right. Now, a lot of implications because one, some people will be um, some people will be um, excluded, so to speak, and that exclusion is still at play today because even though even though it is said in, 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 in principle that there are three official languages, national discourse, national business takes place in English. Because, for instance, the constitution says that the business of government and maybe the national assembly can be conducted in any of the other uh, national languages when appropriate arrangements have been made. But that is hardly the case. Uh, there's no uh, instance of what we are um, any of the national discourse. And I just mentioned evidence of how um, uh, the president spoke in house and the, the backlash that it received. So people are already excluded. But one, one way to do this is when we, we use a variety of Nigeria, because a variety of English that has been Nigerianized, um, it might help. But then 
um, it, it, it becomes closer and closer and closer to the people. This is a, this is a country with over, over 500 languages. So unless you make all the, official, all the uh, languages official and national and uh, compel everybody to speak and learn it, which is impossible, right? That is when you can think of not, uh, not excluding some people. In multilingual societies, it is difficult to, to, to completely do away with that kind of exclusion, yeah. Yeah, so in some, there's always going to be a compromise somewhere, I guess, in all of yeah, these sure. situations, right? Um, I'll try to ask these two more questions here, and then we'll, we'll let you get back to preparing for your Viva tomorrow. Uh, one question is on um, the use of English in education. Uh, is English used as the medium of instruction across Nigeria, and what impact does it have on the quality of education that Nigerian students are receiving? All right, yeah. Um, the policy officially says that um, school children at the lower level of primary education, uh, primary education will be taught in English, sorry, in an indigenous language. While when they move on, they will be uh, taught in English. But this also, like the official language uh, situation, is also a policy in principle. But in reality, children begin to speak and um, to be taught in English as early as primary school. Right, and I and even nursery. I remember an experience I had with um, while I was in Nigeria. I took my 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 daughter to a primary school, university staff school, and of, for me, our home language is Igbo, so we speak Igbo. And the first time, so they asked me, "What do you want to mention about your child? Is there anything we need to know about your child?" And I mentioned she speaks only Igbo, and then. Uh, a week later, the teacher complained, no, I, I, I struggle to speak Igbo to your child, and uh, um, can, can you people start speaking English to her? Well, so I said, well, for me, I don't have any struggle speaking Igbo to her at home, and I know she'll speak English at some point, right? But the policy says Igbo, so if you want to teach English, you are going against what the policy says, and so it is your, it is your headache to handle. That was how I put it to the teacher, and said, you are the only one who is saying this. I said, well, um, that is, um, that's what it is. And just to say, just, that experience, just to emphasize that in reality, it is, it is English. And the effect is that, one, yes, you have said the effect is that the, the low indigenous languages are going to really suffer, yes. But also, if you're, if you're talking about Nigerian English as the language of expression, in Nigerian English is not um, British. Nigerian English is not American. Nigerian English is, is Nigerian. And um, today we talk about Nigerian pidgin being Nigerian. And every language has a history as, as, as usual. So maybe a time will come when Nigerian English, uh, maybe as one of my participants mentioned, maybe uh, one day the, the word English may not be there again. All right, but even though American English, the word English is there, Canadian English is there, and people still identify as, in terms of national identity, these national rights of English define them. So I think, once it becomes obviously unique and maybe more recognized by, by the, uh, the government, um, things will begin to change. Well, you just mentioned uh, uh, Nigerian pidgin. And the last question, there's two people who want to ask you to push it a little bit deeper into uh, this potential contrast or tension between Nigerian English and Nigerian uh, pidgin as a more national creole. So one question is, uh, what would the attitudes of Nigerians be towards Nigerian English when placed side by side with Nigerian Pidgin English? So if you actually contrast them and say, not just is Nigerian English Nigerian, but if you say, which is more Nigerian, Nigerian English or Pidgin? And if you, if you put those two side to side, would people see Pidgin as more Nigerian, as more indigenous, more, more Nigerian than Nigerian English? And then the other comment from a, a former uh, SOAS professor, Federico Luca. She says that Nigerian English and Pidgin are exempt from prescriptivism and, char and that characterizes standard English. So a lot of this baggage about correctness just isn't there in Pidgin. And that makes it easier for this language to be co-owned by multilingual speakers and people without access to education. You don't have to learn Pidgin in school. So how do you see the role of Nigerian English or Pidgin in education and media where so far the standard language culture is prevailing? Although we do see that now there's BBC Pidgin as well. And so, um, you, you did mention in your slide early on those different views of which languages and mentioned Pidgin as, you know, a potential sort of national identity kind of language, but you're, you seem to be emphasizing Nigerian English over Nigerian yeah. Pidgin. So maybe you can talk a bit more about that, that choice. All right. Yes. Um, 
it wasn't one of the, it was not part of what I investigated, right? But there have been studies, um, I, I, if I remember correctly now, by one uh, Iwan Osif, mentioning that there is generally some kind of negative attitudes um, towards um, pigeon because people think it is um, a defect form of English, all right? And uh, most people think it's bad English. In fact, um, one of the studies Ibanusi and uh, Boots conducted, and uh, it seemed that most parents uh, tell their children not to speak a Nigerian pidgin because they think that the growth or the, speak, the use of Nigerian English is pidgin might affect their use of English. So generally speaking, there, there seems to be that kind of negative attitude towards Nigerian English because people, sorry, Nigerian pidgin, because people seem to believe one, it is a defect form, what, that's not linguistically proven, right? And people, uh, in fact, so many people from my study and from other studies do not um, know the difference between pidgin and broken. They call it broken English, mm. all right? And that idea of broken means um, um, echoes images of bad English, images of corrupt English, images of, uh, of um, uh, base electo, so to speak, um, a variety of English. So it is not, even though some um, um, researchers have tried to classify Nigerian English as, as a variety of, um, uh, as a Nigerian pidgin as a variety of Nigerian English, but that's not um, the reality. But um, it's, it might seem to me that there may not be in terms of, uh, some people, I mean, opinions are usually divided about this. People have, have said that Nigerian pidgin is more Nigerian, but it has more Nigerian words and in terms of syntax, um, it is closer to Nigerian languages than English is, all right? Uh, because, I mean, word English is um, syntax um, um, is not that different, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So there may be, and um, that's not part of what I investigated. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your presentation, answering all the questions. Wish you the best of luck tomorrow, as do uh, many of our participants in our chat. Uh, yeah, so thanks again for joining us. Thanks to everyone who took the time to uh, listen in and be a part and ask your questions as well. Hope this has been uh, encouraging for everyone to continue to explore these complex issues and attitudes and their implications, not just for Nigerians, but for many other multilingual countries around the world as well. Thank you so much, Kingsley. Yeah, I must say thank you everyone, all of you. I just, I just um, stopped the screen share now to see all the good wishes for today. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Okay, goodbye everyone. Thank you for joining. All right. Thank you.